Hello, thanks for attending this biology session. This is going to be a short one today. We're just going to do the first two sections of chapter two in the biology textbook, just an introduction to DNA. So we're going over chapters 12.1 um, and 12.2. So the chapter opens with some summaries of um, some of the very early studies of DNA as we tried to figure out what it was. Um, so we start with Griffith, a scientist that did an experiment on infected mice that indicated that genetic material could be passed from uh, one type of bacteria to another. And um, then we had Avery's team in the 40s determine that the molecule that transferred that genetic material was DNA. And then it's, uh, set of scientists Hershey and Chase, they did experiments with viruses to show that viruses also use DNA to deliver genetic material. So both cells and um, viruses, which are not alive, um, have DNA and they use that to get their um, genetic material from one place to another. So they figured out that it was DNA that did this. Um, and then we had scientists that looked at the structure of DNA to try to figure out how it coded that material. Um, so Rosalind Franklin, used a technique called X-ray diffraction to figure out the shape of the DNA molecules. She figured out that it's two strands, that it twists in a double helix shape. And um, this information was used by Watson and Crick, two more scientists in the 50s, that uh, used that work to completely figure out the structure of DNA molecules. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on for this session. So why is DNA so important? Its main role is to store information. So your DNA stores the information for everything that your body does and everything that your body is. Um, all of that information gets passed down from cell to cell through DNA. So along with storing information, which is the number one job of DNA, it also has to be able to copy that information and be sure that every new cell has a copy because this um, is important that every cell has DNA because it tells the cell what to do, how to be a cell. And um, because this includes the reproductive cells, uh, eggs and sperm all get a copy of DNA, the DNA from parents is transferred to the offspring. So how do we have um, a molecule that's able to store so much information? Well, the giant DNA molecule is made up of millions of little segments, and the order of those segments is a code. So it's just like how Morse code is just dots and dashes, but by understanding the code, we can turn those into letters and words and even entire sentences. Um, DNA is made up of four different types of segments, and those are translated into a code that makes amino acids, and those come together to make proteins. So we're gonna look at the different type of segments. So um, I've been saying segments, but the word that we use for these is nucleotides. Those are the little chunks that make up DNA. Um, there's millions of these in a row hooked together. Each nucleotide is made up of three parts, a phosphate group, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. Now, the two parts on the left here, the phosphate and the sugar, those are consistent. Those never change. Those make the backbone of the DNA that kind of hold it all together. Um, and then the part on the right there, the third one, the nitrogenous base, that's what does the code. There's four different nitrogenous bases in the DNA, and the order in which those show up is what codes for things to happen. Um, so there's four different nitrogenous bases. There's adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And those are abbreviated A, G, C, and T. So you are definitely going to need to know those letters, and you're probably going to need to know those whole words, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. And you should know the three parts of the nucleotide. So those are called the nitrogenous bases, and the other two parts are a phosphate group and a sugar. And you put together a whole bunch of nucleotides to get DNA. So, okay, so a lot of nucleotides um, come together to make a strand. And 
looks something like that, but that's only half of the DNA molecule. That's one side of it. To make the other strand, um, other nitrogenous bases come, or I'm sorry, other nucleotides come in and they bond their nitrogenous bases to the existing bases. And now we have a complete DNA molecule. I mean, this is just a very tiny chunk of it, but you got both sides. So you get a sugar phosphate backbone on this side, nitrogenous bases bound together in the middle with hydrogen bonds, and then a sugar phosphate backbone on this side. Now, what's really important is there's rules for how this binding happens. So a scientist named Chargaff figured out this one rule. DNA always has the same amount of adenosine as thymine and the same number of cytosine as guanine. And the reason for this is adenine and thymine always bond together and cytosine and guanine always bond together. This rule is called base pairing and it is super duper important. This helps us um, decode DNA and it makes DNA work. It wouldn't work if they didn't bond together in the correct order. Okay, so we have adenine and we have thymine. Um, A and T, they always bond together and cytosine and guanine always bond together. Okay, so you will need to know that for sure. And here's why. Let's, oh, there's, there's just some image to reinforce it. We have adenine bonded to thymine and we have guanine bonded to cytosine. That's always how they're going to bond together. You never have an A bonded to a G or an A bonded to a C or bonded to itself. You don't have an A bonded to another A. It only bonds to T and T only bonds to A and C only bonds to G and G only bonds to C. So um, we're going to practice with these base pairing rules because um, this is how we can uh, move to the next part of DNA is we have to understand this. So let's say we have a DNA strand with A, C, T, A, G, C on one side. So let's think about what it would be on the other. So remember our base pairing rules for a minute. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it before I show you the answers. Okay, so hopefully that was enough time to figure it out. Our, um, we always have A bonds to T, C bonds to G, T bonds to A, A bonds to T, G bonds to C, and C bonds to G. So if one side is A, C, T, A, G, C, the other side is going to be T, G, A, T, C, G. And I've also just got that shown with an actual diagram showing the nitrogenous bases. So we've got our phosphates and sugars, and then on the right we have the nitrogenous bases, each of the letters. And we're always going to have A bonds to T, C bonds to G, T bonds to A, A bonds to T, G bonds to C, and C bonds to G. And that's our second strand. So you will um, need to know how to do this. On the test, you might be asked something like this, where they give you some DNA and they ask you to figure out what does the other side look like. So you'll need to know how to do that. Just remember those two bonding rules, A and T always go together and C and G always go together. Now, because of the way they bond, um, the two strands in DNA are anti-parallel, and you could just think of that as being they are built in opposite directions. So um, 
we might have this first strand being built from top to bottom and when it's re when it's complementary strand the one on the other side is built it is going to be built from bottom to top um, so it also has something to do with the direction in which these phosphates and sugars are built but for, for what you need to remember is that they just go in opposite directions And then once you have those two strands come together to make two complementary strands that are hooked together, um, they end up twisting. They do this naturally. It's just what happens as it gets built. And so you get this DNA um, that's in the shape of a double helix. So this is really the iconic shape of DNA. A double, well, a helix is a twisted strand. And since you have two strands twisted together, you get a double helix. So that's the end of this section. and. Um, We'll talk about the second half of this chapter in the next video, but if you have any questions on this, don't hesitate to contact your instructor.